On the one hand, there was this um, sit terrible situation going on, people being arrested, people being beaten up, people being uh, um, disappearing, you're hearing lots of And on the other hand, there was this um, um, parallel universe where we had to go to school. Um, you know, life or somehow continuous normal. Yeah, there were two parallel universes. One was th the life that, you know, you go to school, you go shopping, you, you know, you catch the bus. And then there's, you get to school and some people didn't come back to school. Uh -huh. And then people say, well, he was arrested or whatever. And so it was completely unreal because you just went to school and they taught you math, history, music. And then you came back home to look for your dad, for your friends. And it just completely unreal. You just start living this schizophrenic life where you pretend that everything is normal and they come back home. And then it's back to a tragedy where, you know, people are missing. One of our brothers mm -hmm. disappeared, one of our stepbrothers disappeared. I remember when I resigned myself that, that there was going to be, the things were not going to change, that they had won, that they had the power. When I came to terms with the fact that my father had been arrested, to me it was a point of, he was a point of resistance. And uh, I believed so much in him and in, in, in his ability and I thought, I'll go and join my father, whatever he is. And when I realized that he had been arrested the day after the coup, two days after. I had the, he had been through many torture centers and that um, he was powerless, he was in their hands. And that the little contact, the initial contact we had with him was to tell my mum, Miriam, that's my mother's name, you got to get the children out of this hell. If hell didn't exist, Pinochet made sure that he created it. There is nothing we can do here. We still believed, this is un unbelievable, but we still believe every day we got up in the morning, that next day we're going back to Chile. And we went to school, thinking that, and then we did our GCSC, our A-levels, we went to university thinking, that, yeah, we're going back to Chile, and they just went by, and everything yeah, was we always living, living, you know. You know, we were refugees, Ready and we always, back. and this is a problem, you never stop being a refugee, mm. and you're just thinking that you're always going to go back. You always, everything is transient. Mm. Everything is transient. You know, I had children. I still think I was going back. I, I mean, I still do. It just hasn't changed. You never stop being in exile. It doesn't matter. Even when the government says, okay, ex exile is finished. No, it hasn't because you're still there. And the problem is that then you realize you can't go back to, to your country because that country doesn't exist anymore. You have to go back in time and space to be able to get there. And that's no more. In Chile there was a consensus, okay, that they arrived at a point where they are not going to do anything. The human rights was not an issue, it was not a point of conversation in Chile. And except that the people related to the families, the people who actually care what happened, they maintained that campaign, and the people who are outside, who are in exile, like ourselves, maintained that campaign. So when we heard <coughs> that Pinochet was actually coming over to Europe, we started immediately a campaign to see where either we get him arrested, the best we were hoping for is that like we get him expelled from Europe as a persona non grata. That was our dream, to make Chile a prison for Pinochet. Because, I mean, dictators love traveling, you know. It's around the first they like taking power, then rewriting history, and then they like going shopping. You know, that's, <laughs> they all do this, they all do this, you know. Sorry, I'll be flippant, but it's actually the truth. And Pinochet loved coming to London. They used to come, we used to protest, we used to complain in the House of Commons and the MPs will help us, whatever, but he still came shopping to buy arms and to do arm deals in the UK. We could not arrest him. We could not do anything. And then he was arrested. Yeah. The impossible, the improbable. All the things that people said to, to us, you're mad, nothing's going to happen, you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. It happened. And when the impossible happened, then anything is possible. Where is it that we, as victims, have the opportunity to participate in making history and be able to have a say on what happened to the perpetrators of those crimes? And history gave us an opportunity, and we would let, let it go, mm. you know? And we dedicated our life, and we, you know, we left everything, our family supporters, our friends, people at work support us, everyone. Yes. The yeah. 
the English groups here and the individuals and the groups and society itself, they were absolutely wonderful. The support was fantastic at all levels. Absolutely. Absolutely marvelous. You know, they all felt identified, they all felt that they could make a little contribution into this. And it was actually an incredibly positive time. But then came Jack Straw, who preferred <laughs> to be a little politician rather than a great man and let him go. But Whatever little we achieved was uh, to have Pinochet under arrest for 503 days. In terms of actual justice for um, the victims and the relative of the victims, uh, I think our record in Chile is shameful. Um, I would say that probably um, Chile um, is the events in Chile, the fact that we can give you names addresses, telephone numbers, place of work of those who committed the atrocities, torturers, rapists, criminals. The fact that we have all the information, we can give it to you, and those people are free at large in Chile, speaks for itself. Um, I, th I think, I mean, <laughs> We all applaud the arrest of Pinochet, and that, of course, have marked an important uh, legal precedent, uh, which the Chilean squandered. You know, um, Pinochet went back, and well, he died in bed, a free man. I mean, that's the bottom line. He was never tried for any of the crimes that he committed. He denied all, all involvement of all knowledge, which either makes him okay the worst general in the history of uh, any army because everybody was doing whatever they wanted, he was the head of the army, or the biggest liar. Yeah. So, you know, history will have to decide. But the one thing that history doesn't have to decide is that he was here arrested for the crime that he committed and the Chilean didn't try them. The Chilean quarter did not try them. They had the opportunity. They have every single opportunity and they let him go. And the victims, mothers, fathers, sisters, died waiting to know the truth. There's still 1,198 disappears in Chile. Yeah. And those families are dying. The families of relatives are dying. And Pinochet died in bed, a free man. Today it's true that the Chilean courts okay, have opened up and there are more cases going on. Mm -hmm. But of all the cases, there are only 38 people arrested in Chile and actually serving sentences in prison in Chile for the, th the crime committees, where more than 30,000 people were tortured. It couldn't have been committed by 38 people, not in 17 years of, of repression. Our role, okay, as not only as, because um, people always say, you know, you, okay, you know, you have your father was in, in prison, your uh, adopted brother was disappeared. I don't do it because of that. It's because I feel outraged, okay, that criminals can be allowed to walk this face of the earth, okay, and die in bed after becoming millionaires from the crimes they com committed, being free to enjoy their families, to, to enjoy their future, and nobody says anything. If I cannot take them to court, at least I want a record to be left for future generations, okay, to remember that these people were criminals.